So this is myself and Emil's legit first ever conversation. I'm such a huge fan of Emil's and was really stoked that he agreed to sit down with me for a chat. The podcast you're about to listen to was recorded only a couple of days before Crankworx Innsbruck finals, where he literally became the GOAT of Slopestyle. Emil went on to break the record held by Brandon Seminuk for the most number of Crankworx World Tour Slopestyle gold medals with his incredible 12th win. This conversation was quite fascinating. I tried to get an insight into his mental and physical process, and although it still baffles me what he is capable of doing, it was cool to even get a slight insight into what's going on inside his head. Also, just to mention, there have been some of you who've been asking how you might be able to support the podcast, and up until now, we haven't really had a method for people to show the love. We just opened up a Patreon, so if you do want to support the podcast, that is the best and most direct method. At this moment, we are absolutely not making profit from this project. It's purely out of love for the sport and the athletes. But the more support we receive, the more frequently we can produce these. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. Even if you can't afford to donate anything right now, we appreciate every single one of you. Thank you and enjoy. So you're never tempted by doing whip-off? No, no. No, it hasn't really been... I mean, it's just we have practice every day here, so yeah. To take energy to go ride that, I just never really prioritized it. Mm. You've never, but you've never wanted to do it. For sure, I wanted to do it. Like it seems like a lot of fun, so I was always tempted to go do it, but just yeah, never committed to it really. Yeah, just too focused on the task at hand. Yeah. Do you consider yourself more like a performance artist? Or do you think of it more athlete? Mm, some, uh, I I would say that's a balance that I struggle with to find. Um, devil, at the level I want to perform and at the level I want to be able to ride, uh, there is a lot of uh, sides of an athlete that goes into that at the same time as you want to be yeah, it's not like it's it's very hard for me to go ride and be inspired all the time to like do it at a more of an athlete perspective on it. Like go through these certain things because uh, that will make you evolve in that way. Like, I don't know. It's just uh, it's always a tough balance between those two things when you do something that or in general, I think in anything in life, when it, like, it doesn't matter what sport you do, like you need to have the, how to say, I've struggled with putting a word on it, but you need to have, yeah, the inspiration and the motivation and the passion uh, to move forward in creative and fun ways, like no matter how one dimensional the sport you do is. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah. Uh, putting a word on is really uh yeah i don't know like we're, we're our athletes we do sports and i i go to the gym consistently i i do all these things that other athletes do uh jet like still the sport i do isn't as much of a sport when it comes to like a set time that we race you know it's mm -hmm. a bit more um yeah, I don't know the name for it, but it's a well, it's free, in it? It's a yeah. little bit more free, but there is still like a discipline sort of element to it. What role has discipline played in your life? Because some of the free riders are real loose, you know, and they just rock up, and or so it seems like they just rock up and they're just having a good time and super talented individuals and everything like that. So, yeah, how much of a work ethic have you had to apply to get to where you are? Everything. I I wouldn't have been anywhere without it. Um, I, yeah. If you want to reach a certain level of, in anything, like if you want to go beyond what you thought were possible, you need to be able to put your head down and work and work for it and not like, yeah, get lazy with it. I, I would say like, so yeah, in order to, for me to get where I am today, yeah, tremendous amount of work for sure. What sort of role has failure played in, in your life? 
Because mm. obviously, failure yeah, I've is been, super important. Yeah, no, I've been fa- failing is, I would say, more important than success, yeah. honestly. Because um, w- without it, like, really, what is success? Like, you know, like when you really, really, really start to think about it, you need the two elements. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, it's it's always a big part of it. And uh, yeah, trying and doing things make you figure out what you do want to do and not want to do as well. Like, so success and failure in those aspects as well make you grow for sure. Do you take any inspiration from like other forms of um like do you pay attention to the racing do you follow the racing and like downhill racing yeah and things like that i've never been the guy that watches the races uh i never been when i played soccer when i played ice hockey when i played handball as a kid i've never been into looking at the games i've been more like i get more inspired by individuals involved in it like their mindset it can be their way of looking at things and like for me that's what brings me more motivation and inspiration more than anything um i do follow the scene all around mountain biking but um yeah i struggle with keeping up to pace of everything you know absolutely It's, it's a struggle for sure you're busy for sure um is there any characters that stick out in your head as people that have really inspired you it it would be so tough to like on top of the head pick out like i'm inspired by so many different sports and it's like some like growing up like maybe some people had more influence and then that faded and i found some other ones that i got really influenced by and it's like always it's always moving it's never like set how i would say like there's so many individuals that do really cool things and more than anything i don't think i'm like i can like look at one athlete and i'm like i really think and i can really idolize what to do in a certain way but i wouldn't or it could be that I'm not like a fan of everything they do, you know, because mm. you can't be like, we are all different as human beings, but I can take a lot of and draw a lot of inspiration from different aspects of diff- different athletes. Yeah, it's like a very different thing with the whole, like we follow racing. That's yeah. the majority of what we do is downhill yeah. stuff. Um, and judged events for me are quite, quite strange. Um, sometimes, but then yeah. other times yeah. there, the result seems just like obvious. Yeah. How have you navigated like the kind of landscape of judged events? Like where is the line between it being like subjective and it being objective with that? Have you tailored your bag of tricks to meet certain criteria for judges or have you just done what you do? I would lie if I said I haven't tailored my bag of tricks. I mean, we're all this free riders, slope stylers. We get tailored in one way or another. I mean, the tricks that are relevant and score the highest are usually the gnarliest ones that looks the coolest. And I mean, all like ev- everyone wants to do those. Uh, not all the tricks, but there are a few select ones that I'm like, oh, I really want to deep dive into those things. and growing up like i was really inspired by bmx like what they were able to do and looking at where mountain biking is now compared to when i grew up like it has evolved tremendously like it has we are doing really technical things nowadays and the skill set of the riders is very broad and it's like everyone has their own kind of niche of tricks that they are um like experts on and that they master and i think with a judge sport it is tricky like i definitely sometimes wish it was like racing where it was like a set time and it's like it's obvious he passed the line first and that's just 
the the results of the day but um yeah when you have a judge sport that isn't the case um i also think i wouldn't been able like i wouldn't have enjoyed that sort of element the same way as i enjoy it now where i'm like it's a lot more freedom when it comes to like there is only one way to f pass the finish line like front wheel first usually <laughs> but for us there's many ways to get to that result and um everyone has their own recipe in the start list and i think that what's that is for me what's making it really exciting you never know what someone been working on you never know what what's next really um you can look at a contest run from 10 years ago and you can kind of guess at what era that happened um and i think just by the sport always evolving um i don't know i, I get super inspired by it and it makes me hungry to go and push myself and try to open new doors it's a quite a, a mad crossover to me when you've got like art and competition and they're kind of merging so amazingly in slope style um so it's when it's subjective like a good example would maybe be like the first x games real mtb yeah and uh you had seminac but you also had brag and subjectively everyone's favorite was the brag video just because it was yeah. like super hype but then technically the the seminac like was like a better yeah. riding part and i just think it's it's an interesting thing in in slope style because some people might be like oh regatkin's run was like way better totally um what has your been been your process for learning so much stuff switch <laughs> um, was that a conscious decision for, for yeah i mean i it definitely was a conscious decision to start spinning right instead of left yeah um for sure early uh, like how early did you think i need to learn everything switch oh like that's just been an evolution i think like I, I grew up and uh, when when I got onto the scene, like you were like the man if you can do like a switch whip, like that was like the yeah. sickest thing you can do. <laughs> like you, like if you can do all the like flip whips, three whips and all those things and then get a switch whip in, that like you were <laughs> really cool. Like, and so I really fast forwarded to learn a switch whip. And then I did that. Um, I spent a lot of time as a kid on the trampoline bike because I live like we didn't really have any proper jumps in my hometown. I, won't, I went to school five days a week, so I only really could go ride Saturdays and Sundays. So I had an old 24 inch bike that I got when I was like, actually bought when I was like six or seven from like saved up money and then my parents kind of backed me up on it. So I took the wheels off and I kind of made it into a trampoline bike. And I spent a couple of afternoons a week on that probably as a kid, like before I would go ice hockey training or handball and whatever, whatnot I were up to at that time. Um, and I would just do things both ways on that one. Uh, it hasn't clicked to me until later. That was probably why I very early on started to adapt tricks the opposite way because I already done it switch on the trampoline bike even though it's different like you get the technique from it very fast and you can very early start to make your body do what it's supposed to do in the certain movements um but uh i don't yeah why i started doing it and how i've i just got heavily influenced by the people because i think it's really cool like when you can master something both ways that just shows a certain level of 
not only skill but also understanding of what you're doing uh if you can there's a like an example is like there's not many athletes that can explain you how they do things because it's in like it's been an evolution over time and they just ended up there but they don't really know how they ended up there but i've looked at it like but if you can take all your knowledge, put a word on it and explain it to some someone and that could help them, that means that you have a certain understanding for what you're actually creating and how you're doing it and how you get from A to B. And I find it really interesting when you master trick it one way because you visualize it in your mind and you're looking at it like, okay, it should be look like this and you're like kind of looking at the frames at like trying to visualize the different frames when you're doing something, but then you're like, oh wait, how would that look mirrored? And you can't like just get that image out of your head and mirror it, like it doesn't work. So how are you gonna get that to actually start making sense? That's a really interesting process that I found early on that, or that I found interesting. I mean, it doesn't apply to everyone. It, it doesn't interest everyone. Uh, obviously like most writers, uh, are not really doing many tricks opposite. Like it's it's not what inspires them. Like some writers are like way more interested in different things. And well, it's well, like that's what I think is super sick as well. Like what I'm doing isn't necessarily only the thing I like to see. Like I, I like to see the wide variety of tricks, but I know that certain things that I do, uh, only select few people actually can do. And I like to show those things. Mm -hmm. And I like to learn those one-off things that I haven't really seen that many people do before. And that that's always been an interesting and fun process for me to try to like see someone do something and then take inspiration from that, apply a bit of my own skill and knowledge and try to put my own flair on it. And yeah. Has it ever, is that process of visualizing something and then doing it, has that ever came super easy, like straight away? Or is it always like a bit of a really puzzling out? Cause it's, it's almost like problem, problem solving yeah. using your, physical body yeah it's it's a lot of problem solving actually when you do break it down um especially when you start try to learn a trick like it's in the beginning like let's say you learn a cork sab for example first off you just kind of cork as much as you can just over the shoulder and like <laughs> and i don't know a couple of tries down the road of I don't know, it depends on how much skill you already have. You might get close, but you have no gauge of like where and how you ended up where you are. So in order to like get there, you need to do hundreds to figure out which ones don't work and which ones work and then hope that- Unlearn, unlearn yeah. the bad way. Yeah, and that's the difficult part I think for everyone is that it's very easy to adapt to bad habit have you ever got, got something got so far down the road and then you've realized like oh this is not the right way to do it and had to unlearn it yeah yeah definitely um and a lot of times you can master a trick you learn it you're like i wouldn't i rarely ever got comfortable with tricks because i know they bite back as soon as you get comfortable uh, they still bite back even though you respect them like shit happens and it's very like when you're doing very technical things like something's bound to happen at some point. Like that's just how it is. Like it's inevitable, but um, it is very easy when you start to master something that your body, like once you learn a trick properly, you can get really lazy with the whole like body movement going into it. Cause you kind of found a shortcut would be the wrong way to say it, but you found a way that 
the trick works so like if you end up in the right position and everything energy wise a lot of tricks you don't need a lot of force to do it uh unless it's like multi combo like whips or something you you, you do need a power for that but when you're actually in the right position the tricks can actually come around without much force it's more of a mental thing uh to be like you you need to set your body at the right spot like right spot but there have definitely been cases and that happens for everyone i think uh, that you learn a trick you master it and then all of a sudden you just start <laughs> lazy would be the wrong word as well but like you start Complacent. leaning different lee of the lip because you actually found a new way you could enter it and it works really well at certain case and at certain times but then all, all of a sudden like that whole thing you've been working on and like mastering starts going away from where actually working good because you started thinking like the way you do it here is better and then you just yeah need to relearn it and that can be the most frustrating difficult process because then you have, it's almost harder than to learn it in the first place sometimes. Because you're doing things and you're like trusting your muscle memory and your unconscious decision making. But that unconscious decision making and the sub, like everything in the muscle memory is based out of experience. So that will do what it's, what it thinks it's supposed to do at a certain time. But it's very hard to make that switch and like make it do something that he used to do even though it thinks this new way of doing it is better <laughs> it's so complex i think people think of this sport as not like very intelligent um, i mean it's like everyone has their own way to go around it um i'm dive i'm i'm diving in a bit to it now for sure yeah, but yeah. um yeah totally there's a lot more that goes into it totally just the mental fortitude and yeah almost resilience as well like your um a good example maybe like your ro your rotor run like you went for the the nolly three off of the thing and you went for the tuck yeah and you missed the tuck how do you forget that and continue how do you not how do you not get annoyed well like, that's behind me like i can't yeah. do anything about it obviously i was kind of upset upset when i landed i'm like fuck it, i screwed up uh, at the same time it's like well I still got to give it my best shot and see how far we goes because that contest was yeah that was the like i never been to contest where we didn't have that little amount of practice mm. it was so intense like we had a window on the saturday where we maybe had like like the weather cleared up and we got like five hours of practice and we're just riding like so much. I remember waking up on Sunday and like barely get, getting out of bed just because everyone or we're riding so much. Like I wanted to get as much time as possible on the course because it was drying up and then we had rain. So it was just like, you didn't really know where the soft spots were and you didn't really know how the things worked when you actually started to do tricks. So um, yeah. But to putting something behind you is, yeah, it's not always easy. Like it's easy to get stuck up on it for sure. And another, another gnarly thing about this format is watching your mate go in front of you and then he crashes in front of you and then it's you next. Yeah. You know, like that's for a lot of people or most people, it would just completely throw them off. Yeah. And yet you've got to perform you still got to perform this intricate masterful run yeah um how do you how do you handle that i don't really think there is a good way to handle it it's it's very difficult um but it's just the environment that i've been exposed to when it comes to contests the past i were counting the years and it's just like i've done five contests here already in Innsbruck so like I don't really know how many contests I've done in total but just the consumption of going to events seeing your mates go down people really get injured practice people we had a guy today that went to hospital like you don't see everything at events but you hear about it 
and you know the people that get affected by it and it's it's heartbreaking at the same time as you can't really let that stuff get to you mm -hmm. um, if you still want to perform at an event so it's yeah it's a very very tricky balance yeah it's not only like when you get to know people like it seems that like it doesn't matter when you don't know them but when you know them and then you hear all oh, the x has broken their back like this year start of the season we made a documentary with Amory yeah on and then first race breaks his breaks his neck and yeah. it's just like it's a madness and yeah we, we all move we all get very numb to it but it's the pursuit of this uh this crazy sport and this crazy feeling and yeah. we all love it so much it's just like yeah but you yeah, seem like a really resilient human in general um given all your um your past with your illnesses and yeah. everything that's went on where do you think you got that sort of level of resilience or is it does it just sort of come naturally can you explain the word res like i don't really know what res resilience means so like definition of resilience like and to not give up yeah. like if you're resilient you could be hit it's like having armor on resilience strength almost yeah you've been through a lot mm, i would it's hard to say where i got it from i would say more than anything like one thing that i tried to adapt was early on I came by this thing i read and it's like it says don't just go through it grow through it and i kind of took that to heart when things were really, really difficult because i actually started like just looking at it as an opportunity for me to learn something that i wouldn't have been able to do otherwise um i don't think everything happens for a reason but what happens to you, you can make the best out of. Um, and where I got the resilience from, I don't know. I just think it's something that I've been, yeah, by my environment, like exposed to. And I don't know, my parents would never let me call home, like, call to school and say I'm sick if I felt shit you know like that just didn't happen because I would go ride like the whole week and I would wake up on Monday every week and I would feel so shit because I had no energy left like I've been riding like six plus hours like Saturday and Sunday as as a teenager and like to cause like what do you say like to call school and say you're sick like that that just never like I was never allowed to do that um i don't know and that probably like just that in itself like i mean it's a tiny part but that just not giving up thought and like not taking the easy route um that's probably made me the person i am today and i also found that making hard things makes your life easier in a way instead of because if you make easy choices it, your life gets harder, unfortunately. Um, but it is hard to make hard choices. So it's very easy that you make easy choices. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I I never really wanted to be, yeah, like justified by what happened to me. I wanted to like be able to get on top of it and get beyond it and move on and get back to what I like to do. Mm -hmm. sick that was a great answer um what was i gonna say oh yeah do you sort of in order to sort of maintain yourself have you integrated any sort of meditation practices are you a yoga guy like what's your sort of what's your methodology uh, my method of, yeah great question uh i don't really to say I've adapted something would be a lie. So no, I don't do yoga. I don't do meditation. 
but I try to take care of myself. Um, I feel as it's very common where I hear about people that, yeah, wake up super early in the morning and they got to do all these things. And then on top of this, they got to do mindfulness and yoga and all these things to make their body feel good. And it's like, actually, if you just slept for half an hour more, you probably feel better. <laughs> and um, for me, yeah, recovery is everything, like making sure I get enough sleep and making sure I eat good food and work out and try to keep my body in balance which is like one of the hardest tasks there is i think as an athlete when you're doing a sport that isn't necessarily something that your body's supposed to do and in any sport i think at a certain level everyone bumps into overtraining issues and uh, yeah just overall injuries sprained ankles like whatever it may be like just standard stuff that is always occurring um and try to stay on top of that is always a difficult task but um just trying to be in balance is key i think uh yet yeah, it will probably be my lifelong uh, <laughs> mission <laughs> yeah mission and process to do because i've yeah i haven't really found it yet because when i'm riding as much as i want to do my body's in balance but when my body's body's in balance i'm not riding as much it yeah. just it it's a tricky one that i don't think i will find the middle ground to but i'm trying <laughs> <laughs> and with diet and stuff like that are you sort of doing any sp specific supplements are you taking your omega-3s are you doing your yeah. vitamins that sort of thing um i wear on a pretty heavy supplement plan that i don't even know what you know at a certain point that i got uh through my autoimmune process thing and now as my body's gotten more stable i've been able to like actually eliminate a lot so i'm just taking um a couple of supplements for my thyroid and uh, to keep on top of that and then i'm taking omega-3s which is never really a bad thing depend it depends though. if you have a really balanced diet and you eat a lot of omega-3 there's actual people that need to take omega-6 to balance right. it out because yeah. omega-3 and omega-6 as far as my knowledge it goes uh needs to be balanced in order for your body to be in harmony uh, so if you were to take a heaps amount of omega-3 that might actually make the balance worse um but that's outside of my medical <laughs> not knowledge to speak on and like try to make someone take something different than they already do. But yeah, I do take a couple of supplements, nothing major um, at all. And I just try to eat clean. Um, when you say clean, like my mom's got an autoimmune thing and I've got friends as well. I don't know, they're all maybe different. I'm not so yeah. sure, I'm not an expert either, but she's on a paleo diet. Yeah, that's that's what most people end up like down that route um i don't know i think everyone needs to find their own one um or their own way uh for me i just i don't do milk uh i don't really do eggs i don't do any gluten i haven't done for the past five years and i'm doing completely fine uh so that's that's what i do i also don't do any fluoride in or like fluoride in the toothpaste yeah in my toothpaste because that can uh, bother the thyroid as well some people say some people don't like i'm just like i'm doing fine without it as well so here we go maybe i got 10 holes in my teeth in 10 years i don't know we will see but um yeah that's that's how it goes like besides that i'm just trying to eat enough which is the biggest problem that I face all the time like, really eating enough like yeah you just go like a yeah just eating enough because when i'm at home doing a lot just i don't know i can easily very easily get wrapped up in exciting projects or emails and writing training whatever it may be that kind of it's hard to keep on top of eating enough is there a food that you would like throw all out the window for like is there like a like a like a sweet snack that you're just like ah fuck it i'm having this um that you just love too much growing up i used to be crazy sweet tooth like for sure but um over the last couple of years i think i've i haven't really done 
like I'm I'm avoiding it as much as I can. The sugar completely. Yeah, yeah, because I don't like. like it isn't good for you like, <laughs> uh, in big consumptions. Yeah, but uh, it has its benefits, and uh, I do take it when I like in training. Sometimes I feel like it it can boost the training, but um, besides that, I'm um, yeah. So in that manner, that's like my way of saying I try to eat as clean as possible. Like. No, it's interesting hearing you say you don't you don't do any sort of meditation or or that sort of thing because you do seem quite centered most of the time. Um, so that's interesting how you've managed to get yourself here without that. To me, because do you do a lot of meditation? Do a fair amount, yeah. Do a fair amount. It's quite infrequent. It's more like when I start to lose the present and yeah. think about too much then just brings me back to where we are now and it's helped me through loads of different stuff um so yeah it's just interesting to hear you say that do you like sit down specifically to go do it or do you yeah do you have certain ways to like get I mean, into it just i don't know having a walk or whatever it could be you could you could meditate your way through the entire day just by focusing on your breath and being fully in this moment and yeah. noticing the thoughts that occur so uh, maybe by accident you're doing that anyway because you're probably noticing thoughts as they're arising arriving taking note and then discarding ones that aren't serving you in this moment because it's a lot of performance that with dangerous sport is about ignoring a lot. It's about <laughs> reducing the stimuli down to its very, very yeah. core parts. So you're probably doing it as, as you are. I don't know if that's the definition of meditation, but it's like, yeah, just reducing the noise. Yeah, potentially. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's hard. Like I, I can't get inside of your head and you can't get inside of my head. So like looking at what, yeah, what meditation is and how it works for one person to another, it probably can be very different, but uh, yeah. Totally. Just out of interest, like when you're at the top of a run and you hear the crowd and everything like that, do you, are you actively trying to zone that out or do you use that sort of noise as like a, do you get like amped up to go? You know, are you aware of all that? Or are you just kind of focused in your zone? Like, how does it feel? Um, usually very quiet. Mm -hmm. um, is there much to it? You can. It's, yeah, it's so like it's pretty strange, like the way slope style works, and like the way one rider go after another. And you stand up top and by the time it gets to your turn if you're like placed high high in the ranking either for first run uh through your world tour ranking or for second run depending on how well you did in the first run you're usually so cold like you did a run an hour ago and that's a funny thing that i don't think a lot of people think about is that when we show up to contest we do get to train on the course we do get to work ourselves to a state where we feel like this is where we want to be able to perform but then when we're actually supposed to do it we aren't allowed to ride for an hour and then you go full cold turkey almost straight into a contest run you're trying to do the gnarliest things that you could imagine being possible and still m make the way down the hill i've yeah, that's a very strange environment, I think. And that's something that I've never will like. I won't miss that section where you like go from being super cold and only done like a couple of bunny hops in the parking lot to try to throw down the gnarliest contest run that I could imagine. Um, but yeah, it's usually, yeah, it gets kind of quiet as soon as you get out of the crowds and mm. up top it like, in Australia, it was quiet. We we're like up in the forest. They were like the volunteer that told us to drop in 
and then you can kind of hear the finish crawl in the distance but besides that it was all quiet so it could have just as likely been a practice run and speed and style was on you know mm. um and you so prefer that you think that's good i prefer like i like whistler where mm. it's people everywhere it's super sick um that that many people are interested in what we do i think that yeah, it blows my mind um and i think that's the sickest arena we have when it comes to contests but yeah it goes yeah it goes back and forth you switch between like taking in what's outside and um kind of shutting things out um, but it's a difficult process for sure for sure is there like a thing that you say in your head before you drop in is there a ritual in, in terms of like i don't know something that you tell yourself or have you got any specific routine that you do at the top not necessarily i don't think so um <laughs> more than anything just yeah i guess it goes for everyone we all just want to make it down the hill um and yeah uh, i always ask this question on the podcast so go ask it what's your favorite mountain bike film favorite mountain bike film it has been like different eras for sure well like different different films has been like more in my f like i think one of the first ones i watched was like from the inside out i think that dropped in 2011 or something yeah it's pretty niche that yeah um that was kind of when i started i don't know being on just mountain bike forums and uh, getting to know mountain bikers and that was like you need to watch this one so i watched that one and then kind of watched probably everything that dropped since uh that's been in longer format i struggle to keep on top of the short video stuff um because it's actually so much dropping all the time and especially now with more and more people being on youtube it's like it's hard to kind of find the ones you want to watch that is of interest um because there's so many ones to choose from <laughs> just the selection is so broad so um i think from the inside out was one of the earlier ones or the first ones i watched watched that plenty amount of times um favorite mountain bike film would uh, honestly been so many years that i don't even know which one i pumped the most but about just some standout ones maybe not ones that you've watched the most but just like ones that you really yeah made an i mean impact. like not bad yeah was definitely a favorite because when then that one dropped i want to say it was like 2015 potentially 16 that was right. before i started competing internationally i was like oh trek is the sick sickest team there is and they get to go on all these trips and stuff and uh they had a stacked feel the riders and i was like that oh, seems like the best and then not too bad as well i watched and the unreal there's been so many ones that i've like kind of then it was the red company one as well um that was based around like the life behind bar series um i watched death grip when that one dropped that one i don't how many years ago is that 20 16 i want to say 18 or 18 something like that and one movie called like gamble or something yeah yeah i don't yeah, yeah. it's been a couple of years since i went through the list and like watched uh any um something i would like to do more but i don't know it just well it sounds like you watched quite a lot actually like yeah well i'm, I'm a mega fan of mountain biking like i watched probably every single video part that dropped from the age of 10 till i was like 17 or 18. um and then as i've more and more gotten a part of the scene um i just like it isn't the same as it was when you were a kid you were like full-on frothing it and you were like i had so much free time as well as a kid so 
whatever like whatever extra five minutes I could have, I would watch a video part. Um, that doesn't happen as often nowadays as it used used to. But yeah, there's so much on the internet to watch. Does it feel cool to be making stuff like in that same way that you know when you're young and you're just absolutely frothing it and can't get enough? You'll be making that stuff for other for other kids now yeah totally but it doesn't feel real like it yeah. doesn't feel i've gotten to a point and gotten to understand that that is in one way or another the way it is that i'm now influencing younger writers that are coming up but at the same time as i'm like i'm still the kid and i'm still like i still struggle to see myself being a part of what i grew up looking up to you know mm -hmm. um yeah it's kind of a strange thing like that when you think about it, it's a very few amount of people that actually get to a level of where they dreamed of as a kid to get and it's it's, it's a surreal thing at the same time as there are certain aspects of it that um yeah, it just 